the Wright Memorial in North Carolina. Museum first. Boy, it's a windy day. It's been a good day to start a, to test to see if an airplane can fly. The wind is blowing. Orville. You know, she's about the same age. Uh, getting ready to test fly his vehicle here at Kitty Hawk. I don't know whether it'll get off the ground, but it's windy enough. I don't think he'll need much power today. This is inside the museum here. Is that a uh, duplicate? I think the original's in the Smithsonian, isn't it? Yeah. Look at the terror on Arvo's face. Even though he flew only for a few seconds. He said, Jesus, creepers. This thing's really off the ground. The elevator, the nose rises much too quickly. He tries to level off, flies straight into the ground. Collapses the front end. Takes him two days to put all the pieces back together. Next day they're ready, December 17th. The brothers open the door to the building on the left out here at about 8 o'clock in the morning. Gaze out across this open field. It has rained hard here the night before. Puddles are standing. Each puddle is covered with ice. Winds coming right off the ocean almost 30 miles an hour. Wind chill, negative 4 degrees. The brothers dress that morning in their business suits, coats and ties. Now, they didn't do this so much to be stylish. They pretty much dressed this way. This is the way city men dressed. But also, they hadn't planned on being here now. They had trouble with their engine. They broke two sets of shafts. They're running way behind schedule. Winter has hit. This is the warmest thing we brought with us. They cook breakfast, clean up, hope for the weather to break, and it doesn't. At about 10 o'clock in the morning, Will stands up and says, we have waited long enough. He reached over him where their beds were, grabbed the bed sheet, smashed it down, ran outside, nailed it to the wall of the building on the left that faced in that direction. That's the signal. To the men at the life saving station, the brothers are going to try and fly. Three men walked over to help. Adam Etheridge, Willie Doe, John Daniels. That's not enough. Besides the brothers, it takes about a minimum of five people to get this thing in the air. No one else lives in this area. Remember all that privacy we asked for? No flight. William C. Brinkley sells lumber over in Mandia. He's heard about a new shipwreck up on Kitty Hawk Beach. He's driving up there hoping to salvage some wood and sell it. He drives past this site and he notices someone had nailed a bed sheet to the wall of the building. That's rather unusual, isn't it? He drops over to find out why. That's four. <laughs> Johnny Moore apparently didn't, never liked school. <laughs> it's Monday morning, he's only 16, 16 years old. That's where he should be, right? He's not. He's walking north up the banks of Kitty Hawk Village. He gets cold. Guess where he walks up looking for a cup of coffee about 10 o'clock in the morning? That's five. <laughs> now I want to stop here for a second because I, I want you to leave here sure in the knowledge that that is all. I'm a native of the banks. I'm from Hatteras, Mixed Island Dine. I've had thousands of people from all over the world guarantee me their grandfather was here on the morning of the first flight. <laughs> now, if there had been as many men here as claimed to take part, part in this adventure, the brothers would have not needed an engine. They have plenty of muscle to pick this thing up and throw it to Norfolk. <laughs> but no matter what you hear or read from now on, believe one thing, those five names, and that's all that showed up. And this time, buddy, no hill. This time, the launching track is placed on the level field beside the building. This is the real thing. Playing on the cradle, the cradle on the rail, or the wire to hold it back. Adam, do you suppose perhaps you want to take a picture of this? Uh, before you got here, this gentleman and I have established anyone in this room who believes man can fly is crazy, correct? All right, see, that's what we're fighting. Our witnesses, four uneducated men and a 16-year-old boy. If you and me, if we fly this morning, you think we better have to prove it? All right. Orville is an outstanding photographer. 
He has taken hundreds of pictures here. He cannot take this picture. It's his turn to try and fly. Will has used the camera, but he can't take the picture either. Will has to hold the wing up like this and run along beside the aircraft during takeoff or it'll fall over. They grabbed John T. Daniels, local fisherman, surfing at the life-saving station, never used a camera in his life. They placed him to the side and rear with a camera aimed at the spot they thought the machine would lift into the air, and they leave him with these instructions. When it flies in front of you, squeeze the ball. Or with the controls, will at the wingtip. Spin the propeller, open the throttle, drop the wire. The machine begins to roll forward along this open field faster and faster. When it reaches the spot where that granite boulder is standing, it lifts into the air, flies forward 120 feet in just 12 seconds. Madam, you have done it. Imagine this. Three and a half million years we've been at it. And you've flown. What's your first thought? Wow. How about, how about, how about this? John, did you get the picture? <laughs> That's a proof, isn't it? First things first here. I have the pleasure of knowing John's daughters. He only has two left. They're delightful ladies. They come here every December 17th. They're, they're, they're getting very old. They can barely walk. But with help, every year at 10.35 in the morning, they walk to that boulder and place a wreath out here for their father. John was a hero in the life-saving service. But when that local man saw this 605-pound flying machine suddenly rise into the air, he lost it. <laughs> I didn't know where it was, but they find it confused over here. When they managed to get him calmed down, they checked the camera, and the shutter had been dropped. John had squeezed that ball, but he had no idea when. <laughs> the brothers took the negative back to Dayton just on the off chance, and they developed it. John Daniels will always have a spot here because his photograph is of the first few seconds of power of flight this is it. Look closely, you see the takeoff track, the carriage. You can even see Will's footprints as he ran along beside it holding the wing up. But the Wright brothers knew that that first flight, if they stopped, would always be treated as failure. Scientists have already established that we have enough power to make a momentum leap like a frog jumps of 300 feet. To prove real flight, you got to break 300 feet. 11 o'clock in the morning, second attempt, 175 feet. Third attempt, a few minutes later, 200 feet. The brothers are running out of time. They're sure any day now, Samuel Langley is going to fly here, D.C. They don't know that Langley has already crashed into the Potomac. A witness of, of, of his attempt wrote, Dr. Langley flies like a handful of concrete. <laughs> but the brothers believe they're involved in a race. It's noon. Wilbur gets another turn. The machine is ready. It is launched, rolls, rises, only flies 20 feet, gets hit by a crosswind, makes a sudden dart for the ground. Will twists the wings, levels off, flies 852 feet in 59 seconds. Local men here said Orville took off running down the field screaming, Go, Will, go! Johnny Moore leaves this spot and starts running four and a half miles to Kitty Hawk Village, going to be the first one to spread the news to the world, and we stop. And if you want to know what happens from now on, there are a number of excellent books on the Wright Brothers. Now I'll be... The, uh, the duplicates are the original stacks of the uh, Wright Brothers, where they did their, their work. First flight took place, there's the markers. Down 800 feet. You can see the last marker down there. The end of the flight. Change the world. The monument. I showed you at the beginning of the tape. Built in 1931 or finished in 1931, I believe. This is the monument uh, to 
describing the first flight. the trail of the first flight from the beginning here the beginning and then down this path to the end the heart of market down in Mark one, two, three, and four. This is the end of the first flight, and second, third, and then the fourth down there in the 800 foot. So the fourth flight. Well, Wilbur then turned around, got out of the plane, and says. Golly, I flew that far. I did it. Our ferry boat captain is Cuckoo. He's going to go over there in reverse. Well, that's Hatteras there. So long, Hatteras. Got your tongue? The girl got your tongue? Well, we spent last night on Ocracoke Island, quaint little island. We're on our way to Cedar Point. I'm not, uh, I think that's on the mainland. It's about a two hour and 40 minute ferry ride. 
see the birds are with this fairy also as the people feed them. Okracoke is just a little uh, tourist and fishing village. Uh, I think the hotel we stayed in is, uh, I don't know whether we can pick it up, just a lot through here. The white building, the village inn. Reminds me of the village idiot, the village inn. When we come back, this would be a neat place to stay here, this pirate hotel. Sucker there, he stays in the, in the water and just gets the leftovers as it falls down. But while the rest of them are up there flying around. Oprah oh, Cope Harbor on the ferry. On our way to Cedar Point. North Carolina. Swing around to the way the ship is going, the ferry is going, and to the open ocean. Merrily's on yet another cruise that I've thought of. Cool. See the lighthouse? Second cruise? <laughs> Captain of our ship. Don't know whether you can see him through the glass there. We come into Cedar Island. Point. Carolina, which is just the tip of the mainland and uh, thought this was an interesting house. I suspect it's about the oldest house here. Look at the old handmade boards on it. The captain's quartered the, the right at the ocean so that they can see out and see the fishing boats coming in. This is a fishing community. This is the courthouse. Jail. Uh, incidentally, I don't know whether I told you, but this is Buford, Buford, uh, Buford. Buford, I think they call it here in North Carolina. A little town, it's a coastal town. Uh, one of the three oldest ports in the United States, I believe the lady said. She's about to get to the end of the tape, so I better uh, snap it shut here. <laughs> 